Shabbat Shalom, everyone. When you begin to, to take tefillah, to take prayer seriously, when you begin to, to study the Siddur, and you begin to look at the words as being more than just a, a mechanical expression of our tradition, but as philosophical statements of beauty, of spiritual guidance, sometimes you encounter roadblocks. Um, I, I had a colleague that told me that he uh, never had as much trouble praying as when he began to actually learn Hebrew. Because once he knew what he was saying, he no longer knew what he was saying. When it was just Hebrew as an incantation, it was easy. When they were words that were penetrating into his mind, he had to think about them. And thinking about them, well, that was more challenging. And there was a section at the beginning of our weekday prayers, originally found in the Yom Kippur liturgy, but has migrated to our daily service, that is particularly troubling when you first begin to encounter what it actually says. It says, God, what are we? Right? We are nothing. Right? Our wisdom, pff, nothing. Our power, pff, nothing. Our righteousness, nothing. Our ability to save, to deliver, nothing. Compared to animals, we are no different than them. Everything we do is pointless which is a really uplifting way to start the morning. <laughs> to, to read this very stark, almost nihilistic reading of existence, or at least human existence, to say, when I look out at the entire universe, I am overwhelmed with how pathetic and powerless I feel. Thankfully, if you keep reading, the very next paragraph begins to uh, give us a remedy having stripped away our illusions of self-importance, embedded only within ourselves, it tells us aval, however, but we are b'nai Avraham. We are the children of Abraham. Okay, how does this help? How does being a child of Abraham somehow counteract this nihilistic tendency this feeling of hopelessness and pointlessness that is found within the uh, extensive lament of the first paragraph. Well, we turn to Perkei Avot to try and find out what does it mean to be B'nai Avraham? What does it mean to be a child of Abraham, to be one of his students, to follow in his path? And Perkei Avot suggests that there are three characteristics of being a, a child of Abraham. You have to have a good eye, you have to have a humble spirit, and you have to have modest appetite. Now, modest appetite, we're not talking about how much you take from the salad bar. Modest appetite means that you are not consumed by what you can consume in the world. That the focus of your existence is not about how much you can acquire, not only of food, but of any of the different pleasures and material goods of this world. You need to have a proper perspective. Enough, yes, to get by. Enough, yes, to be moderately comfortable, but the ultimate purpose of life is not that. And we see this exhibited in Abraham's life. Right? He is somebody who has no problem of letting go of fortunes. He has no problem of saying, I do not need what has been taken back as loot from my fight when I am uh, returning from the battle of the four kings, this can return to everyone else. He has no problem of letting go of that treasure despite the risk he took to get it. He has no problem of splitting up the land with Lot even though Lot should have no claim on the land. He has no problem. He is okay with what he has. A humble spirit? What does a humble spirit mean? This is probably the easiest for us to relate to. Right? Abraham, despite his greatness, and Abraham, despite his uh, amazing uh, position in his world as well as in our history, is a very humble person. He does not assume that he has the right to lead. He does not uh, bully or uh, attack those around him despite his overwhelming power and right to the land and his position. He is somebody who is always willing to be submissive and subservient to those that he can help. This, of course, is one of the hallmarks of his hospitality. When he engages in hachnasat orchim, one of the true measures of a person who is being hospitable to others is that they do it 
not because they think they are earning brownie points, not because they think they are impressing their guests, but because it is truly a joy for them to serve someone else because they do not feel in any way, shape, or form superior to their guests. They are simply happy to have the opportunity to help another. But the ein tov, a good eye, what is a good eye? Right? I mean, nowadays we use good eye to mean a sort of technical expertise. Right? Oh, you were able to identify that, uh, that special breed of dog. You've got a good eye. This is not what our tradition means by a good eye. Any uh, guesses of what this might mean? To not acquire knowledge, to see things, to understand them, what they are. A very good idea and certainly a wonderful trait. Not what it means in the idiom of our rabbinic Hebrew. Ooh, so close. It is the complete opposite of the evil eye, the ein hara. But what is the ein hara? <laughs> so what is the good eye? And to understand the good eye, we have to understand what the evil eye is. Nope, not quite, not quite. Again, we have to look for what the ein hara is, the evil eye, which a lot of people throw around as saying, oh, look out for the evil eye, without understanding what it means in Judaism. Best for every, what was the last word? People. The best for every people. Right? The ein hara is built around resentment, bitterness, and jealousy. When you see somebody else who is successful, you look at them with envy, you look at them with anger, you look at them with bitterness, and you wish them failure. That is an evil eye. I don't worry about curses and all of that other nonsense. An evil eye is that bitter jealousy of another person's success and the feeling of hatred that you have towards them because how dare they have happiness that I don't feel I do or I feel they don't deserve. The opposite, of course, when you are the child of Abraham, is to have an ein tov, is to have a good eye, which is to look at another person and to wish them well, to look at them whether they are doing well or whether they are in hardship, and to hope that they will have better, to have this un, uh, unending uh, flowing of love and of generosity of spirit towards another of not feeling that you are in competition or that you are in some kind of uh, race for others, for the success and the blessings of life, but to recognize that God, as infinite, can provide infinite blessings to all of the people, and therefore you should only wish them well. Now we understand, when we go back to our blessing of the beginning of the service on our regular mornings, when we say, we are the children of Abraham, and this is meant to lift us out of our despair or our depression about our powerlessness. When we recognize that when we take the perspective of Abraham, when we see that our abilities may be uh, very modest, but then so should our appetites be. Yes, we may not be able to acquire a massive amount in this world, but we should not want to acquire such things. When we see that our humility should be part of our, our spirit, we understand that reminding ourselves that as amazing as we may be, the accomplishments we may have achieved are the accomplishments of others, that really we should not be so proud of these things. They are nice, they are good, but we must remain humble. And then finally, to recognize that when others have succeeded, when others seem to have moved ahead of us, this is a blessing. This is good. Yes, it is not the end all and be all of the measure of a life, but we can look and we can wish them well. Because after all, exactly how much further ahead of us have they gotten? And why should I begrudge them the place that they have reached? To look at this world in this expansive, in this generous, in this um, way of wishing blessing for all of the world begins to raise you up from that feeling of despair and hopelessness. By changing your perspective on how to look at the world, you begin to realize that there is meaning and purpose that is separate from our powers, that is separate from our abilities, that is separate from all of the typical measures 
of our success in this world. And then we move into the realm of Abraham. And once we are there, the text goes on to say, we also must remind ourselves of being the children of Isaac and the children of Jacob. But understanding what each of them brings to our spiritual character, that will have to wait for another discussion. For tonight, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.